you please be with us in this study. Please renew the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our minds that we may be able to understand what Brother Jeff is teaching us. Um, please open up our hearts and, and be with us, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to pull together things on the lightning and thunders and voices and hail, but I didn't get there. Uh, but I, I have a couple of other things that are kind of out of the sequence of what we're studying. But one of them, maybe it will help Michael. Maybe not. Um, so the one that might help Michael is the, the one on the top of the complete page. We'll do that last. Um, a sister from California. This is, the, this is page one. Okay, this is page two. On page one, the sister from California is following the class. So she, she sent these two quotes in in terms of uh, earthquake and resurrection, where it says, when he arose. We're skipping the first one from manuscript releases. We'll go back to that. <coughs> when he arose, a victor over death in the grave, while the earth was really and the glory of heaven shone around the sacred spot, Many of the righteous dead, obedient to his call, came forth as witnesses that he had risen. Those favored, risen saints came forth glorified. They were chosen and holy ones of every age, from creation down even to the days of Christ. Abel. That, no, that we, not Abel. Why? Well, she, she's going she's gonna to explain herself here. That's Adam, from creation. From cre yeah, that's all the way from Adam now. Yeah, so if from creation, it would either have to be Adam and Eve. No, because they weren't slain for the word of God. In the other quote that you read yesterday, it's clearly saying that those that were slain for the well, word there's of God. Well, the next quote's going to show it's not Abel. Okay. okay. So, but, but from creation, they were the chosen ones and holy of every age. That last... Um, where does it say that they have to be yesterday you slain? Read, yesterday you read a quotation from what you gave us. We read you. That they were martyrs? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so that, that I'm not worried about upholding her premise. Her premise was, was Adam, and if it's got to be martyrs, yeah. then we would have to have evidence that Adam was somehow martyred. But in any case... Next quote, Then the dead that are in the grave shall hear his voice and came forth to life, and not only to the earth, but the heavens themselves shall be shaken. A few graves were opened at, at the resurrection of Christ, but as at his second coming all the precious dead from righteous Abel to the last saints that die shall awake to glorious immortal life. So she starts it at Abel. So he's, he's the one that comes up at the second coming. That's what she that's what I think she was saying. No, no she no. was saying that, that he could be resurrected from the uh, first fruit the, because of he was slain, but that's fine. He, she was talking about the special rec resurrection oh, um, that precedes the second coming. So, is, if we're pardon me, I'm saying, or, or is she going? Or is, it, is she going all the way back to then saying that righteous? Yeah, I, but it says from righteous Abel. From but it, I get your point. It could be from that period of time, starting in the period of Abel onward. I, and this isn't a big deal, right? I mean... So why didn't she say Adam? Why didn't she say what? Adam. Yeah. Because Adam wasn't slain. Oh, it wasn't slain. Okay. Abel, Abel was. the, what, what I think the logic is from this sister, and maybe I'm wrong, Jeff, but... Yeah, the ne her logic is laid out in the next paragraph. That's her words. Yeah, and... Oh, I didn't read that. Um, well, what I was going to say is Adam is one, it, from creation would be Adam, so he was raised with Christ, but... So yeah, that's exactly what she, Here's yeah. what she says. Adam was one of the... This is her words. Yeah. Adam was now? right in the center of the page. This okay. is... I just cut and pasted her email, all right? Adam was one of the ones resurrected when Christ was resurrected. Adam represents those resurrected from death to self at the midnight cry. Notice she has a question mark. She's not pushing anything. She's doing sanctified speculation. First recreation of man, taken to heaven, faithful witnesses, 144,000, don't taste death, testify to Bible and Spirit, Law and Prophets. Abel represents those resurrected from death to self at the loud cry, resurrected at the second coming martyr. So she's, she's oh. trying to make a distinction between Adam and Abel and place them at the midnight the cry and the Sunday law. Uh -huh. uh, 
as symbols of those two way marks. But maybe if if you, that first resurrection has to be those slain, then Adam doesn't fit. Anyway, the next one, I always... Uh, Do we have notes yesterday? Did you give us any notes? No, it was just from... Bill. No, the but they're, on the, they're online now. What, the, well, the references we referred to yesterday, I don't know if they're online now, but I've sent them to Michael. I wrote them down. That's why it's so awesome the class is up the day of the class. And these are on for today. Yeah. But there's, there's a question I get on a regular basis, you know, like once a year. And when I try to find the quote the question is asking for, I never can pull it up, so I figured I'd put it out in the public arena because I never remember the words. So where it says, Jeff, this is the question. And I think this might be one of the brothers from New York. Was one of them named Chris? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You know, but it's just Chris. So I also know a sister named Chris from the East Coast. So I don't know. Jeff, I have a question about several Spirit of Prophecy quotes and thought you may be able to give me a lead. Years ago, I heard a quote read to the effect that God was keeping individuals away from the church because of the church because the church was not ready, but I haven't been able to find it. And there is a quote that says that, and I never can remember. It says something like, "The Lord does not now lead many into the church because of the condition of its members." Or I have something. that quote on my wall. You have it on your wall. I have. I can grab it. Grab me. it. That's uh, that's the reason I'm bringing this is because I never can find that quote when people ask. Another quote that I haven't heard, that I've heard but haven't been able to find, is to the effect that Satan is also working hard to bring his converts into the church. If you can give me any tips on those quotes. Now, I think all he has to do is read the parable of the wheat and the tares. It says that the enemy sows these seeds. You know, it's right there in the parable. Um, but the answer to that is the quote on Satan is on the next page. I passed over a quote, we'll go back to it. Christ's Object Lessons 70 and 71 answers the, the question about Satan sowing his seeds on your wall. I had uh, the sticky note one day, somebody gave me a quote and I thought, whoa, that proves what we're saying. And I jotted it down and slapped it on my wall. So I, I had to look quickly and see if this is the right one, but I'm pretty sure it, it says what you're saying right here. So I remember reading this recently. The quote that you were, were talking this is from Desire of Ages, page 76, 786, and it says this way. It says, They were those who had been co-laborers, co-laborers with God and, and who at the cost of their lives had borne testimony to the truth. Now they were to be witnesses for him who had raised them from the dead. So if you were going to argue with Adam, you'd have to give evidence that he was somehow martyred. Yeah. And you'd think if Adam got martyred. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a logic to Adam being martyred. He's the first Adam, Christ is the second Adam, and Christ is martyred, so there might be. But we, I, I've never seen any evidence of that. Where are, you, where are you at on that, Michael, or should I go to the I'll, next? I'll just go to the next one. Okay, on the, on the next page, this is the answer to the brother's question about Satan sowing seeds in the church, which the parable teaches. Um, but I put four paragraphs in here because there's a couple other ideas in here that are worth considering. You want to read that first paragraph, Gabriel? He, sow, he that sowed the seed. He that sowed the good seed is of the Son of Man. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The good seed represents those who are born of the word of God, the truth. The tares represent the class who are the fruit or embodiment of error or false principles. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Neither God nor his angels ever sowed the seed that would produce a tare. The tares are always sown by Satan, the enemy of God and man. Sister Tanya? In the East, man sometimes took revenge upon an enemy by strewing his newly sown fields with the seeds of some noxious wheat that, while growing, closely resembled wheat. Springing up with the wheat, it injured the crop and brought 
trouble and loss to the owner of the field. So it is from enmity to Christ that Satan scatters his evil seeds among the good grain of the kingdom. The grain, the fruit of his sowing, he attributes to the Son of God by bringing into the church those who bear Christ's name while they deny his character. The wicked one causes that God shall be dishonored, the work of salvation misrepresented, and souls imperiled. This goes right along with what this quote says. Quote Wait says, a second. Oh. Let's finish this. Brother Jim. Christ's servants are grieved as they see true and false believers mingled in the church. They long to do something to cleanse the church. Like the servants of the householder, they are ready to uproot the tares. But Christ says to them, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them, but both grow together into the harvest. <coughs> Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church. But he has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. He knows our nature too well to entrust th uh, this work to us. Shall we try to uproot from the church those whom we suppose to be spurious Christians? We should be sure to make mistakes. Often we regard as hopeless subjects the very ones whom Christ is drawing to himself. Were we, were we to deal with these souls according uh, to our imperfect judgment, it would perhaps extinguish their last hope. Many who think themselves Christians will be last, will at last be found wanting. Many will be in heaven who their neighbors supposed would never enter there. Man judges from appearance, but God judges the heart. The tares and the wheat are to grow together until the heart, and the heart is the end of harvest. Harvest, harvest. is yeah. the end of probationary time. Christ object That answers his question, but what I wanted to, that last paragraph I wanted to include in there because sometimes we forget that there's a distinction between an open sinner and a tear. An open sinner, the church has a responsibility to remove from the church. They won't repent. But a tear is different. And sometimes in the Laodicean condition of Adventism, they use the story of the wheat and tares to say, oh, you just let everybody in the church and you don't address someone that is an open sinner because Christ taught us to leave the tares alone. And a tear is not an open sinner, right? Yeah. Okay, so the other quote he was looking for that goes right along with it, yeah. what, what's the reference? It's tes uh, Testimonies, Volume 6, page 370. I'll read <coughs> The selfish, health-destroying indulgences of men and women have counteracted the influence of the message that is to prepare the people for the great day of God. If the churches expect strength, they must live the truth with God, which God has given them. If the members of our churches disregard the light on this subject, they will reap the sure result in both spiritual and physical degeneracy, and the influence of these older church members will leaven those newly come to the faith. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth because the church members who have never been converted to, to never been converted and those who were once converted but have backslidden. What influence would these unconsecrated members have on new converts? Would they not make of no effect the God given message which his people are to bear? Now that's the one. Can I have something with the tears? One thing that I have learned about the tears in the Middle East is that these would give a final, would give a fruit that if you were to take that seed and you boil it, it creates kind of anesthesia effect. Like if you were to be under anesthesia, and then if you take it in, you you're under like a sleeping kind of stupor, but you can't get out. So, so it produces Laodicean condition. Yes. So can you compare, contrast that point further? The I get the open sinner, but the tear, what's different about the tear sins? Uh, they don't a hidden sin? Is that what you're saying? I mean, yeah, not, I don't, not just hidden sin. I can suspect that someone, I can't judge motives or character, but you know, I can suspect that someone is not very spiritually zealous you know, in the church and that there's something wrong there, but I don't have the, the right to discipline, get involved with disciplining that person. But... Uh, you know, if someone's living with a woman and they're unmarried, 
that's open sin. You got to deal with that. Yeah. Okay. The other one, so you're just saying you can't put your finger on, but there seems to be an issue. Okay. Yeah, but it's, what it says is many times we're wrong. There really isn't an issue, or, the, the or is there is an issue, issue and the Lord's right. working him through it. Yeah. I, I think Saturday gave a good example with those three that were trying to over overturn uh, Moses and Aaron. The appearance looked like they were, you know, ruling for the same thing, but their motives, they've been trying for a long time to overthrow Moses and Aaron, and finally, they were, revealed, they were revealed their true feelings inside. This is the same thing in the church. The tares appear so much like a Christian, acts like one, looks like one, does everything that is right, but the heart, the motives in their heart are wrong, and that's why we're saying we cannot judge the heart because we don't know only the Lord does. Yeah. That, that on the contrast, you can't identify the wheat either. You can't really truly identify and say that person is going to be saved. That's There's right. a statement yeah. where she says, We cannot now tell who are the wise and who are the foolish. Yeah. And it's up to the you can't tell to either. The separating. And that takes place at the harvest, which is the close of probation. That's also a good, a good point of reference. The, the very last sentence there from Christ's Object Lessons about the close of probation being the harvest. So, we also had um, a discussion somewhere recently on the bottom of the first page from Review and Herald, July 2nd, 1889. The Bible teaches that, that the 11th hour workers are the ones that are going to come and carry the gospel. Okay, and sometimes, sometimes we, I, I often wonder about that because. The logic is, is that Seventh-day Adventists that are going into the Sunday Law crisis, they're going to be forbidden to buy or sell, so they're not going to have the money to bankroll the loud cry. And so the, the Bible teaches the 11th hour workers come in and they carry the loud cry message. But there's, there's a weakness there. What is it that would allow the 11th hour workers that are standing faithfully for Sabbath to have the ability to buy or sell any more than the Adventists that are standing faithfully for the Sabbath. Before they get plucked off. M maybe, but here, there's a comment in here where she seems to imply that, the, that it's not the money that the 11th hour workers supply, it's their talents. It's, it's, you know, this work began in sacrifice, going to end in sacrifice, it's not so much about money as it is about a willingness to be a tool in the Lord's hand. Isn't that where you say that the wedge is the, the health? Or the entering the wedge is the health message? Well, that goes, the yeah, that goes, goes in there. The last work that's given is literature also, but let's read this one. Who, Kathy? <coughs> there Bot will be, yep. Yes. Yep. There will be those who will come in at the 11th hour and they will receive an equal reward with those who have long known the truth. What's their equal Are reward? The bottom of page one. The bottom of page one. Yep, you got your you had your finger on it. Last paragraph. There will be. Right there. Oh, okay. What's the equal wages? It's the parable where the, the people that heaven. No. It's yeah, like, heaven. It's salvation. Oh, yeah, that's right. If if you're defining heaven as salvation, well, everyone of the gets salvation. Where everybody, you know, the the people that came in last got the same pay as the people that that's came it. in first. Yeah. That's it. That is that penny is reward, salvation. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead. And we'll receive an equal reward with those who have have long known the truth. And why is this? Is the, is it because they used all their talents? It is. Oh, it is because they used all their talents to the utmost of their ability and brought all their powers to bear on the work of advancing the light of the truth. When the truth was brought to their attention, they accepted it with joy. And God could trust them with a large measure of light and power. A great work is to be done in the earth, and while men sleep, Satan sows his tares. We must awake. Jesus is ready to work mightily in our behalf. So, I, I realize that you can interpret, and prob probably correctly, <coughs> they used all their talents and all their powers to bear as financing, that may be part of it, or, or maybe the majority of it, but here it's sounding like it's their consecration to the Lord. 
you know, maybe it's both because at that yeah. point in time, maybe they haven't had everything taken from them. Yeah. And they haven't had to walk away from everything, and so they realize they're living in the end of the world, and and they're coming on board, and they just give what they have left before the government can seize it all. Anyway, that's in the mix. Um, so, Michael's dealing with a brother that I've known for some time, and uh, he's. I'm not trying to be negative or derogatory, I'm just trying to be accurate so we understand he, he, he's a, he leans towards being a theologian, okay, and a theologian uses the methodology, Who? The do I want to put his name in the record, no, I, no. I thought I heard you say, uh -uh. no, Michael's dealing with someone, oh, Michael's dealing with someone, the, um, so he has those tendencies, I've known that for a long time. Um, where, where it's more difficult for him to follow the line upon line, I assume. Uh, but he only connects with us intermittently. I don't think. I don't think I've seen him for, or interacted with him for maybe six, seven years, maybe longer. Okay. Um, so he emailed me recently, and Michael's got wrapped up in an email dialogue with him where he's saying that, you know, he understands the 2520, he, he accepts that, that seems important to him, but he's saying that 9-11, he can't buy that. And so I've been watching how Michael's been dealing with him, and, and just, this isn't just for Michael, this is for everyone. I have, a, I have a point to make that isn't this one. First point, Michael started him where, where many people start on the subject of 9-11, and they use the quote about New York City. I want to remind us that we taught everything we understood about Islam in 9-11 before we discovered that quote. I linked him to those videos you did about the East Wind and the Ten Kings for that reason. So that, that, um, that quote should be last, if, uh, perhaps. I think it should be last. But, but when you're in a, when you're in a like group like this, okay. where everyone already accepts it, then that quote, we can use it you know, freely. We get it. Uh, but they should be led along to see the, the biblical logic before they get there, and then that's the knockout punch. It's not the opening jab. But if, if I understand it correctly, where this brother really, uh, he, he may not know it, but where he, his, he doesn't have the ability to see this truth, is based upon this truth here in these top two paragraphs. You, you want to read these, Michael? And I'll explain what I mean. We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Verses 31 and 36 quoted, through 36 quoted. Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. We see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for we are now entering upon the time of trouble spoken of in Daniel 12, 1-4. Okay, so, uh, this, this, I was dealing with a little bit of this on the, in the sermon on Sabbath, and the sermon on Sabbath was different for me. You know, if I'm going to present a sermon, I usually, I'll have some ideas on the logic I'm going to use and start develop it, developing it over some days or whatever. It didn't happen like that. I never really knew where I was going with that sermon until I sat down and put it together. And I sat down and put it together like probably an hour and a half before we went to church. So it was, it was like up in the air, and I don't ever do that. But one part of that sermon that, that has been, you know, coming into a, a different 
significance in my mind is the development of this message, okay? That's why I pointed out there's a 12-year period here from, from 1977 to here. And then in 1989, Daniel 11 verse 40 is fulfilled, okay? By three years later, the, the understanding of these verses is coming into clarity. And seven years later, this foundational message, so to speak, is formalized, okay? So, if you can see it, this is, this is the line of the tribe of Judah that you have an increase of knowledge at the time of the end, and he is he's developing a truth that no one understands, you know, because we're all Laodicean, so he's putting it together piece by piece. So and why, in, why do you have 1977 uh, This This is... Uh, no, that, that's when we were baptized. Okay. Um, we were married three years before that in 74, which has nothing to do with anything, but she said we were married. But there was a marriage here. A friend of ours got married in 1989 in our backyard, and it was during that time period that we were studying. And what we were studying was the reform lines from a passage in Selected Messages. That's where we started studying the reform lines. So the reform lines. It arrives here in 1989, and so does Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is, is fulfilled with the collapse of the Soviet Union at the same point in time that you're, stu you're studying the reform line. So both of these truths are going through history at this point in time, but nobody really fully understands them. Okay, so 1996, the message of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is established in... Some people don't understand it. They, they make the, uh, the foolish assumption that the things that I was teaching during this period of time, that I knew these things before I started getting out in the public arena and teaching them, and that isn't true. Okay? Uh, the, the truths that I was coming to understand, they were being presented to me through God's providence, and I was having to grapple with them. Okay? So as I went out into the public arena from this point on teaching Daniel 11, 40 to 45, this passage here is brought to the attention because when I start, right from the very beginning, when I start studying Daniel 11, I look for everywhere I can find where Sister White references Daniel 11, and this is one of the very few places. And what she's teaching here is that the history of Daniel 11, verses 30 to 36, parallel the final fulfillment of Daniel in verses 40 to 40, 45. Okay, so go to Daniel 11, 30 to 36. It, this won't take this long, but I, I want to put a couple thoughts in your mind before I point Michael in the direction. And, he, and his interaction with this brother may be at an end. In Daniel 11, verse 30, Sister White cuts into verse... 30, when she quotes this, if you, if, um, you see in the bottom of the first paragraph, she cuts, in the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that <laughs> shall be grieved. Okay, verse um, 30 says, for the ships of Chittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved. She cuts <coughs> off the part about the sh ships of Chittim, and she takes it from there. And return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant, so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And she's going to quote all the way, including verse 36. And then the second paragraph, after she's quoted from verse 30, he shall be grieved, to verse 36, says, scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. So when you're studying the last six verses of Daniel 11, and in the first paragraph, it says the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its fulfillment. You see that sentence? If you put Great Controversy 356 with that, what does Great Controversy 356 teach? Anyone know? Is it that the time of the, the, end, time of the end is 1798? 
Okay, and in Daniel 11, verse 40, what's the first five words of Daniel 11, verse 40? In the time of the end. And at the time of the end. Okay, so Sister White teaches in Great Controversy 356 that the time of the end is 1798. So verse 40 begins in 1798 because it says, and at the time of the end. Yes, everyone got that? So when she here is saying, has nearly reached its complete fulfillment, what portion of the prophecy of Daniel is she speaking about? What comes after verse 40. What comes after verse 40, but also verse 40 is incomplete. It, it begins in 1798, but it's illustrating history. So, so this paragraph is referencing the last six verses of Daniel 11, and she says that verses 30 to 36 parallel the history of verses 40 to 45. Do you see that? Yes. Yes, you do? I, Go ahead. One point, I, maybe you said it, I missed it if you didn't, but the other point is you confine, she confines you in a window of time because she says verse 40 is 1798, and then she says Daniel 12, 1 is the close of human probation, so now you're stuck in a window that you have to understand it's verses 40 to 45. Yes. Go ahead. I just found an unpublished um, thing that has to do with the 11th of Daniel. Uh, she says here, um, The truth is to go all parts of the world. It is no time now for us to lay off our burden. The message must be kept before our churches. Um, present the truth in its high, holy, sanctified character to the people. Repa pages 13, 14, 15, and 17, from Testament 1. The last crisis is close upon us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th of Daniel has almost reached its complete, complete fulfillment. fulfillment. Soon the scene of trouble spoken in that's the prophecy this. will take place. That's this. Read also the 31st and 32nd chapters of Exodus. After oh. Moses coming down from the mount, found the children of Israel engaged in idolatrous worship. He stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. In this call, all, we off all were offered an opportunity to repent and take their stand on the Lord's side and receive forgiveness. But those who refused to stand by Moses on this occasion met with a fearful end. Read the painful history and the instruction given afterwards by the Lord to Moses as recorded in the 30, 33rd and 34th chapter of Exodus. That's not my point, but go ahead. That's interesting. Uh, that's interesting. What she just did for us is she took Pentecost, there was this history of Moses and getting the law and all this disobedience, the, the rebellion that took place there, which she already makes the Sunday law somewhere else. <laughs> And she throws it into Daniel 11, 40 through 45. So now, now we have her t saying Daniel 11, 40 through 45 is talking about the Sunday law. Even though we, she, we already know that, but she just said it very plainly right there. Okay, but that's not my point. Nah. Like, when, you, when, you do it, when you're studying Daniel 11 and you get confronted with this, you realize that verses 30 to 36 parallel 40 to 45. So let's read ver verse 31. Whose turn to read? My turn? Okay, I'll read verse 31. <laughs> An arm shall stand on his part. <coughs> and, and the other thing to factor in here is... Well, anyway, and I'll, I'll get to this factor. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Verse 31... <laughs> is paralleling a history in verses 40 to 45. Yep, exactly. It has to. Yep. So you're forced. Now, what are, you, what are you forced to do? And this is what, it, what I was forced to do. Go back to this line. Go back to what? You have to deal with the daily again. Well, not just the daily. You have to deal with everything in verse 31 and, 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 and all those verses. You have to come to the correct understanding of what the history of those verses represent if they're the pattern for verses 40 to 45, right? Logic tells you that. So if you don't know it, as I didn't know it, as most Adventists didn't know it, if you dive into verse 31 and you go to the theologians of Adventism, they have a completely different teaching about what verse 31 represents than the pioneers did. Okay, and if you don't, if you don't know that, that's one thing, but once you're, you're stuck with that dilemma, you're trying to figure out what this verse is because you know it parallels the last six verses of Daniel 11. And if you've got an incorrect pattern, there's no way 
that you, and this is where, this is, this is the argument that blows the theologians out of the water, okay? Because they have a position on verse 31 that's this Protestant interpretation, the General Conference guys do. And there's no way their, their application of verse 31 corresponds with verses 40 to 45. It just, there's no way it can line up. It's just, it falls apart. So they avoid this quote like the plague because it puts them in the spot. But if you go back to the pioneer understanding of these verses, then you realize, as Tanya brought up, that the daily isn't Christ's sanctuary ministry. The daily is paganism. Okay, so if you go back to, to the daily, the pioneer position of the daily, be and find out it's paganism, and at the same time, back in this history, I'm realizing ah, there's, there's two... Two opinions. There's the theologians of Adventism and there's a pioneer position. And at this point, I'm telling you, I don't know much more about the, the authority of the pioneers than anyone else. This is where I'm starting to learn it. I'm getting thrown into a, a, a place where I have to figure it out for myself. And I come to conclude the pioneers were right. Okay. So, but I'm realizing I'm getting, there's years there. Where the whole argument, there's certain arguments that come up in this history at a different point in time. And there was several years where the argument, the primary argument, was the daily. Yeah. And so I, I, at that point, I, never, I didn't know one thing, one way or the other about the daily. I'm having to defend the pioneer position of the daily, even though I barely know it. Okay, But I reach a point where I know the pioneers are right. I can defend it at, at least the surface level. My understanding of it's growing. And what do you suppose is, is providentially opened up to my understanding that is the argument that I can use when I'm presenting to an audience the pioneer position of the day? The charts. Yeah. Okay. Because right here, it says taking away the daily sacrifice. Now that's, that's still open for interpretation. Is it the, the theologian's understanding of the daily? Or is it the pioneer understanding of the daily? But when you get to this chart, yeah, it says uh, the, the abomination that make a desolate or papal, papal dominion taken away. 1798, now up here, up here. Pagan dominion or daily taken away, Daniel 1131. So it says it right here, paganism. So I begin to use the charts, but this becomes, I begin to use the charts Chart. In charts had both these charts, both these charts translated into Spanish as I traveled. Had both these charts translated into Spanish. In this history, I'm using these charts before 9 11. I've never seen the 25 20. You know, I, I to roll these out in front of people repeatedly uh, across South America in Spanish and in, in the United States in English. And I, I you know, sometimes I look at this stuff down here and I just, well, I don't know what it means. I'm not worried about any of this, except I want to use, show that the pioneers believed that the, the daily was paganism. And I want to do it because I want to have the accurate history of verse 31, because this is the history that illustrates Daniel 11, 40 to 45. I didn't realize that Daniel 11, 31 is on the chart. That's interesting. In the... the and not, not understand, I didn't understand any of it. You, you, I know people might not think that, but I mean, I didn't understand there was an argument about the daily in the beginning of the 20th century. I didn't know that Sister White says the thing she says about Daniel and Prescott being you know, directed by Satan to introduce this false teaching of the daily. All this comes through the providential leading of the Lord. Angels expelled from heaven gave it to Daniels and Prescott. So I'm learning these things progressively as the line of the tribe of Judah is open and open and up. But the point is, is there's there's a controversy in this history to the point that one of the General Conference guys, one of the theologians on the Biblical Research Institute, he and I get into a public disagreement where we exchanged papers. And in response to our interaction, he ends up writing the, one of the quarterlies, Sabbath school quarterlies. And he addresses the daily, 
and he, and he puts the wrong view in there. So Adventism at large doesn't understand that, that his motivation for those three months of Sabbath school co- quarterly <coughs> was this argument yeah. that came out of this history, and he's pushing the wrong view. You know, Gerhard Fandel was the author, and, uh, and he's still pushing the wrong view. We have all of those are recorded in future news, and we have... They're all in future news? Yeah, I can post the link to them if you want. And, and, he, and Michael will post the link if you want to check that out. <clears throat> that isn't my point. That's, that's just part of the story, but I want you to see this is a, it's just as it says, it's an increase of knowledge. The truth is, is opening up to men, but it's all at the Lord's leading, okay? He, he made sure the places I was going that there would be some self-appointed theologian that was going to, going to defend the theologian's position of the daily. And by that, he was, he was for instance, one time I was in Dwayne Dewey's house in San Bernardino at the end of some meetings or before some meetings, some one weekend, and Duane had a, 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 an old friend that was an Adventist pastor who, uh, who upheld the, the wrong position on the daily. And, and Duane, the way he is, he, he wants to throw us both in the same frying pan and see if the, the water that gets thrown in the grease pops when it hits the grease. You know, he wants to see the sparks fly. So, so this guy comes over. And he starts giving me a, you know, a, a lecture on how he understands the daily. And you know what he tells me? I've never seen it before. He tells me, this is his argument. He tells me that in Daniel 8, 11, the word that's translated as taken away is room. Whereas in Daniel eleven thirty one and Daniel 12, 11, the Hebrew word that is translated sir. as take away is sir. And, and I, never know, I never knew that. It's just never do it. This is where I'm learning this one. This guy's telling me I'm wrong, and as he's telling me, I'm 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 seeing the and he's given me the correct definition. Room means lift up and exalt, and sir means take away. And after he points these two things out, he's continuing on with his theology, and I'm looking at it and I'm realizing, wow, this is the strongest proof of the pioneer position I've ever seen, and I've never. I never knew to even consider that the, there would be two different Hebrew words that were both translated as take away in the book of Daniel. So the enemy of the truth, the Lord uses to open up, I think it's the strongest argument, the room and the sir, if you're going to deal with someone. It's two different types of taking away. That's how this was developed. It wasn't developed by any human wisdom. It was developed by the providential leading of the Lord. Okay. So my point is, is before 9-11, the Lord providentially, he brings these charts into history. Not, I didn't, I, I think I knew the quote where Sister White says, this was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. I didn't know anything about her endorsement on this chart. But it didn't click on me how significant that quote was, that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. Because all I was using this chart for was the daily. I, it just wasn't clicking for me. The, the understanding of the significance of these charts comes in here. This is where we begin to realize that this is the foundation and that every reform movement, there is a foundation laid and suddenly this is the foundation and the foundation is going to be attacked, Sister White says. So, and for a long time people were saying all oh, the mistakes and that quote was... Perfect. It says there is a mistake. Yeah, the, but the argument over the singular, the the uh, sacredness of these two charts, it comes here. But these two charts are out here. He's he's familiarizing God's people with them. But more than that, he creates a he allows a controversy <clears throat> to become so pointed. I mean. We were having meetings in South America where people were standing up shouting at me, and it, you know, more than one group. And I'd have, to, I'd have to make them stop and let the translator translate this guy's foolishness so I could respond to him and then translate that group's foolishness. You know, it, it wasn't just you know, a nice home Bible study. Sometimes it was out of control and it was over 
th over these subjects. So the point is, he made sure that the discussion on this part of the chart <laughs> became so sensitive that you were going to defend it. You, you, you were going to, you know, he made, it, he made you understand that this is a truth that needs to be stood for before we even got to here. Years. So, when you come to this brother that is <coughs> dealing with 9-11 and he says, what, you're teaching about the third woe and Islam is not valid, but he's, he's also saying that because you guys are teaching Islam and the third woe at 9-11, you destroy your credibility <coughs> So no one's going to accept the 2520. He says the fact that you're teaching Islam and 9-11 and the third woe at this point, it prevents some who would accept the 2520 from accepting it because you guys are the representative of these things. And what you're teaching about 9-11 is a bunch of foolishness so people won't listen to what you say about the 2520. Yeah. Okay, that's his logic. Well, that's the same thing that some people like to do. We know of a certain man that he took the 2520 and that, that, that was the whole, his whole religion was the 2520 and that's just a piece, that's just a piece of, of that chart. You can see it's up on the top, but the whole thing is full of okay, truths. So the, the point is, Michael, the foundation comes in here. What this guy is not understanding is the reform lines. Yep. The foundation is here, and this is the foundation, and Islam is right here and right here. Yep. Okay, so Islam has got to be here. Yep. It has to be here because that's what these foundational yep. truths are marking, yep. is right here. Mm -hmm. He's not understanding the reform <laughs> lines. Sure. He's not understanding that this... Waymark was typified by August 11th, 1840, when Islam is restrained. He's, he's, he's missing all that. Absolutely. Um, one of the, the issues that I've had, because I, I thought about this and I realized that's what he's not getting is the reform lines. And then I thought about, oh boy, that's going to be a giant email in order to explain to you. Because in one sense, technically, He's, he's even kind of right about the third woe and the plagues because we know that all three woes repeat, you know, but I can't, I can't tell him that. He's never going to, I have to go through a whole, so I, I, I'm determining whether or not I'm going to sit down and spend the time to write him a giant email. I'd send him or, back to some stuff that's already that, been I sent, I sent him to your videos and I, that's kind the, of the, the, the thing about it is, is He's going to be held accountable for not keeping up with the advancing light of the third angel because he was connected. He was following this message back in here. And his, his, the guy that was his teacher, his instructor, was so in tune with this message that when he translated this message into his, his language, Chinese, this guy's teacher, he took what we were teaching and put it into Chinese. Okay, yeah. so... He, he should have kept up with the advancing light. So you're dealing with someone that, that may be just a distraction for you or someone else to try to just spin your wheels and you're not going to have any effect to turn him around. But all I'm saying is that he's not understanding that this foundation was, the stones were all cut back here. And part of the, these stones are these truths. Yeah. And they're put in place here. And uh, that's why I don't think if you're going to lead with the third woe or 9-11, that the quote about New York City is where you start. Yeah, that's good okay. you, you, put, you put August 11th, 1840 here in place with all the other reform lines to back it up. And, and then you go into the story of Ishmael and show that he's a symbol all the way through. And, but, so... Um, what was, what did I want to say about this quote? About Daniel 11 being repeated? Yeah, I, I'm, I've, I've lost that. <coughs> I just want to throw a little comparison, which I think is kind of interesting. You guys got married in 74. Sister, well, I got married first. Then she receives the Sabbath, and then she got rebaptized. 
I just think it's kind of interesting that you guys almost repeat the same thing. Same year. Just to write it down. Mm -hmm. I, I never saw you guys that. have been married 38 years. I just wanted to say. That. No, uh -uh. we haven't. We've been married 41. Where's your <laughs> Where's your your calculator, my brother? Oh, I if, I, if we were married in 74. Oh, so I was counting from 77. Yeah, if we were. Okay, we were 70, married. You've been baptized 38 years. Yeah. I was 38. Yeah, I was have. the number 38. That's what I was looking at. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> What is a seven? That is cool. We have what? What is a seven between what 1989 and 1996? You've got a th that's three from years. from the time of the end is until the message is formalized. Is, um, okay. The time of the end is the opening up of the book of Daniel, and the book of Daniel is formalized in 1996, or the, okay. the last six verses of Daniel 11 is formalized. 38 is a significant number. 38 is a significant number, but I don't know what that means. What is the 38 significant? Of, of 1838, Josiah Litch's prediction, oh. and in 38 is. T it's in the Moses, Bible twice. It means the 38 years up. when they're. It's in it's in the Bible four times. Oh yeah, that's right. Cause you, you got a couple kings. 38 years. Yeah. 38 years, but in the story of the wilderness wandering, the 38 and the 40 are right. together. Right. Together. Yeah. But they're always arising up. Um. So. That's what this guy isn't understanding. If you do, if you spin, you'll have to determine. That's what I saw. Is if I was going to get involved with the email, it would require writing a book, yeah. B yeah. to bring him up to speed on everything, work. and it's it's his <clears throat> fault that he did not keep up. Yeah. With the light, because he, he has, was connected he has to this a long to time ago. Keep up or just to. This is, this catch up if he wanted to, but to make maybe my, this is just an yeah. argument he wants to make. Uh -uh. To you make to make my point, the biggest issue that because he seems like he seems sympathetic, sympathetic in the sense that he he's attached to Jeff. Um, at least this is how he seems, and he and he yeah. doesn't want mm -hmm. to disconnect. He wants to correct Jeff where he's wrong is what he sounds like he's saying. But the the point is for me to explain it because I, I was looking at what he was saying and all that we were wrong on. Almost everything that you're saying. Yeah, but there, another thing okay, you're but doing. You, didn't you just say yesterday that he was being um, connected with? No, the drop biggest, that, drop that. Yep, yeah. he denies that. Enemies. He oh. denies that, but I know that he was in the past. Oh. I know that. Yeah. But another thing you're doing wrong, I think. It seems like there's three issues that you brought up, but I only remember two of them. You're dealing with the third woe, but you, you're. You're spending time on the 144,000. I wouldn't even touch that. I, w I, w I would have taken one issue, the third row, dealt with that, rather than get two or three arguments going simultaneously. You <laughs> yeah. focus in on one and you try to nail that down one at a time. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure what to address because it it's all connected in some senses. You know, if you believe this, then you can't believe what we're saying here. So you need to know that this but is That's also one, one of your one. weaknesses, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's your weakness. There's your weakness. You, you like to put in a whole bunch. Yeah. No, he wasn't put. He, you read him. He wasn't doing a whole bunch. No, you go back I'm to your comments saying, on uh, Daniel's too, too busy. Yeah, and too busy, yeah. Daniel's was a but former uh, general conference president. Is that correct or not? Yeah, he okay. was a general conference president. Um, and the threefold union there was he and Prescott, and Prescott was a theologian, and of course Willie. White. Which was the protector of Sister White. Yeah, I just sent you a letter about that. Yeah, that. that she says that in other places right. as well. Um, <coughs> and that's. I think what William, William means is defender. Of the defender. Yep. A middle name's William. It's like a helmet or something. Oh, that's that's yeah. Defender. Okay, so I hope that wasn't too much of a distraction for every everyone, but um, I did want to, uh, there's something about this history, the development of this history that seems to be getting focused on in terms of who, what's taking place back here. What's taking place back here in the story of Samuel? There's a, there's a prophet. This is the guy, the man of God that comes to Eli. The first warning. To the you. first warning. Okay. And Samuel is going to show up here with the second <coughs> testimony. But who also is this guy? He's a prophet, isn't he? 
No, 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 not the prophet, but in the where what other illustrations are the are there of this in the Word of God? Oh, is it the the, the unsanctified one? The a disobedient prophet? Yeah. No. Okay, no, no. I'm not talking about that. I don't. I don't understand. The okay. Question. The the writer's ink corn. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. And you just pointed out that all this message was ever only written with an ink horn. Yeah, yeah, it's always been illustrated on a board. Right. Um, from the very beginning. Um, always. There's never, I mean, even in South America, I can remember times where we had to use cardboard. Mm -hmm. We to, did Philippines once. Yeah, or butcher paper. Yep. Um, so there's, a, there's something about this history in relation to here that is now being opened up by the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which means there's something that we have to understand. What would you call that history? Like it's a relationship of Elijah and Elisha, yeah. uh, and, or Moses, the, the Law and the Prophets. That's the thing that's coming in now, the Law and the Prophets, Elijah, Elisha. There's something that the Lord is trying to open up in that regard. It could be the hewing, the hewing time. <coughs> I don't know, a label would be nice. The, what? The, what this time? Is the, this is the from, 19, from the 1989 to 9/11, or even the preceding part. This is the hewing. This is the, in the terms of this is where the stones are being prepared for the foundation. Yeah, oh. yeah in relation to the foundation. It's it's very <coughs> interesting that Elijah, when he comes to he comes to uh, Beersheba, Beersheba, Beersheba to what? Where's the two? Dan to Beersheba. Dan to Beersheba. Now Beersheba, he basically that's where he leaves his first servant. Because he's planning to go and basically has the gut to, to kill him. He wanted to die. Remember, he was running away. And now Beersheba, he leaves his first servant. Then he has an encounter with God. Then the Lord gives him the, the command to go and anoint three people. And one of them was Elisha as his follower. But Beersheba, with points like that, uh, where's the Where is Elisha anointed on this chart? Pardon me? Midnight Cry. Midnight Cry? No, 9-11. And then Elijah, Elijah is 9-11. Midnight Cry is Elisha. Elisha is anointed at, right. at the Midnight Cry. Is that right, Gabriel? We can let Wesley get by with that? <laughs> yeah, he's right. It's 9-11. Sure. Pardon me? I'm not so sure. Yeah, well, be sure. He's anointed right here. Yep. So who else is anointed Jehu. right here? Jehu. Jehu. And uh, the other guy, uh, Jeroboam? No. Oh, I'm not sure. The other guy, the... Haziel. Oh, Haziel. Oh, yeah. A oh, Haziel, yeah. And so, you got three anointings right here, and what's the... Who is... Elisha's pretty easy, right? Who's Jehu? Jehu is the one who's going to destroy the house of uh, Ahab. He takes over over the Ten Kingdoms, right? Yeah, and he's going to, because of his service, there's going to be someone that sits upon his throne of his posterity to the fourth generation. So there's a story about Jehu, but Jehu had some inherent problems, didn't he? But who's Haziel? He is uh, Assyria, somebody Assyria? Uh, yeah, Assyrian king. Yeah. Okay, so is Elisha a bad guy? No. It, is Jehu... Well, yeah, he, he becomes wicked, but he does those, doesn't he? That, this here and this here are representing, I believe, the two enemies in this history, because there's two enemies at the time that Elisha's active. And, and Sister White defines the Haziels as who? I don't know why I'm going here. Who, who are the Haziels? The they're the Sadducees. Oh, oh they're the ones with the Pharisees. These are the Pharisees. She doesn't. She doesn't say it. I don't know if I'm spelling these right. She doesn't say it the way. But the Bible points us out that whatever Jehu didn't slay and whatever Hazael didn't slay, Elisha will slay. Yeah, but the point being is, she says there are even now, Haziel's being trained in the school of the false prophet. So who, who gets trained in the school of the false prophets? The, the liberal theologians of Adventism. Whereas Jehu is a symbol of this 
zeal for God that is not really a zeal for God. It's too aggressive. They're the Pharisees that are um, out to get you. But anyway, that's pretty much... What time is it? 10.43. That's... I wanted to put that in the record. I wanted to go through voices. So, have you got any... Who has some time today or this evening? Oh, look at all the hands go up at once. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you want? I've already started on lightning. Lightning, I think, is... I'm trying to put in place the voicey, voices, lightnings, thunderings, earthquake. earthquake. We did the earthquake and the hail. Okay. I was going to go with voices. What do you suppose the voices are that take place when the Holy Spirit's poured down, either as the latter rain or as a judgment? Well, you could, if you merge it with the Pentecost, you know, you had voices, you had many different voices, different language. Yeah, but you also got the voice of Abel. Yeah. You got those kind of voices, but you have yeah, the, the, uh, the voices voice. of yeah, the angels voices. coming down. I heard another voice from heaven saying, so we need to wrap our mind around voices. The, the Someone want to run like voice tower, and voices? At the Tower of Babel when they confounded the you, We can do Team Creepback on voices. Too. Okay, and you're going to have it tomorrow morning? Yes. All right, Team Creepback. Oh, wait, wait. What is it that you're wanting? Just I'm, list We're wanting Bible Miller's verses. Rules, the line upon line, applied and brought together so we can form a conclusion. <clears throat> in the context that there are four places in the book of Revelation <clears throat> where lightnings, thunderings, voices, earthquakes are manifested, we want to know what that is. There's only 16 places in the Bible where voices is used like that, but if you type in voice, there's 456. Whoa. So maybe you should stick with voices. We're going to do plural. We like plural. <laughs> yeah. I think you have to do some voice, too, even if you don't do the 400. Because I, I, I think Abel's voice from the ground is a singular. Okay. And... And you would, you would think, when we've already seen that the earthquake in Revelation 11, that these witnesses are slain, yet they continue their testimony. That sounds like a voice from the grave. And we know that in the Mara vision, we're being prepared to give a message. That's a voice, but we're in a death experience. So I'm not sure that you can get by with just voices in the plural. So... How much time do you guys have? Prepare a cast for tomorrow. <laughs> kind of good answer. What do you we say? Just, we just brought Michael into it, so if you y'all want to come over, we'll just we'll do voices what did he together. Say? <laughs> what, what He's, I got to prepare for a class tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> what's your, what's your so, other, what's what, your what one do you word. want, Sister Tanya? Okay, I'm still working on my article, but yeah, I'll take. I'm working on my article that you asked me to do. Yeah. Okay. So, but I, I can take. I can help. I can do the. Um, I've, I've been checking light on the Kathy outlines. and I will do lightning and thunderings because I've already started lightning and, and I don't know how you can separate lightning from thunder. Yeah, and seven thunder seems pretty easy. <laughs> so you want to do hell? Sure. And what are we missing? We've already done earthquake. Voices. Kathy and I will do lightning and thunderings. That's everything. That's everything. I'll, I'll work with them on voices. Wait, we'll bring you guys in too. So we'll so, do it all um, together with voices. The um, yeah. five, what's the word I can use to uh, uh, capture all five of these issues, points? What, what's a, a word? that uh, Five effects. Five effects of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Is that? Yeah, I'm thinking you can consider that pouring, throwing down of the fire as the cause and it produces this effect. It says, and there were after it's thrown down. Is that okay? Is that a good label? Yeah, that's good. That's good. When I did some research yesterday on the unpublished work, Sister White was in Italy, that. and she was in some mountains, and she pointed out that underneath those mountains was a lake of fire. Like, people were walking above a lake of fire, and that when the earth <laughs> was going to hit, that lake of fire was just going to come out. And That's well known in Italy. Really? What, like the volcano? Yeah, that, that volcano, was it Vesuvius? Mm -hmm. You know, that in past, and even in, in the past 15 years, it went off again. 
if, if that's what you're referring to and that's what she's referring to. But I, I mean, we know that the, the, the whole the middle of center, the, center of the earth, the earth is molten is fire. Molten right? fire yeah. It's just kind of a scary thought to think that you're walking you're above starting. a lake of fire. I mean, yeah. it's just. You are right now? Yeah, I mean, right now, it's, there's a lake of fire beneath that just waiting to, at, an, at the earthquake, to just come forth. And just Sister well, they say volcanoes produce diamonds. You know what? Yeah, vo vo volcanoes produce diamonds, because and there's places in Arkansas that you can go collect diamonds. You know, search for them. Oh yeah, we have and diamond mines. Hot springs all over. is that water is hot because it's coming from some place that's got something hot. Yeah. 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 The, um, there's something interesting about the the molten masses of things under the earth. It's Sister White when talking about the flood. She says that all of the forests were pushed under the earth and turned into the coal mines that we now harvest. Then coal turns into oil, and that these these produce this oil and gas and coal that creates this dynamic that exists under the ground. You're so, gonna get us a bunch of emails now because. But go ahead. My my point is my point is that the first destruction of the earth set the stage for the second destruction. The destruction by water was God setting a time bomb that's going to explode at the end of the world because she says the second destruction comes because of all of this coal and the, the compression Not of the because. gases. I thought the, I thought well, that... God, God comes and, and destroys the earth, but, but this, is his, this is what he has in store. What's under the earth is what he has in store for the people at the end of the world. I thought the coal was from all the antediluvians and stuff. That's yeah. what he just said. That's what I'm saying. It's all the trees. Organic all the organic all, matter all the organic, and the trees yeah, and whatnot. Yeah. Go okay. ahead, Tanya. Oh, I'll, on this uh, quote that I read to you earlier, um, it, it goes on a little bit further and actually ties out with the erecting of costly buildings. She, she, she basically tied, she talks about the, the Daniel 11, 30, yeah, th that She does that also in Testimonies Volume 9. She references Daniel 11, and as you go down, she talks about the buildings coming down, and then at what she's quoting from the Bible, and after she's quoted several passages from the Bible, she makes that same statement. We should not now be building large, expensive, extravagant buildings. That's one of the signs of the end. My point was it's the Alpha and the Omega. The first destruction tells the story of the last destruction. And they're both symbols of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the water and fire. So anyways, that, that was on. But there's and always a controversy the about her statements about coal and oil, is what I'm saying. Oh, really? They're the same yes. symbols of Satan, the water and the fire. <coughs> Counterfeit. But the first one that she says, she actually, it's on 1903, but then she has another statement in 1910 that hasn't been unpublished. So it's 1910, she says it. So I have to send you that so you can read it. This is what I just read. This is from 1904, not 1910. Brother Jim, you want to have a closing prayer? Dear God in heaven, thank you so much for this day of life and extending our probation. Thank you that we could come together and study your word. Lord, I um, pray that you please forgive us our sins, and I pray that you please keep us safe from harm and evil and sin as we progress through the day. And I pray all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.